Welcome to episode 181 of Real Health Radio. You can find the links talked about as part of this episode at the show notes, which you can find at www.7-health.com forward slash 181. That's www.seven-health.com forward slash 181. Real Health Radio is presented by 7 Health. 7 Health works with women who feel obsessed with and defined by their bodies. Using a non diet, weight neutral approach that combines science and compassion, we help transform your physical, mental, and emotional health. We specialize in helping clients overcome disordered eating, regain their periods, balance their hormones, and recover from years of dieting by learning how to listen to their bodies. And we're currently taking on new clients. If you're ready to get off the diet roller coaster and heal your relationship with food and your body, please get in contact. Head over to www.7-health.com forward slash help. And there you can read about how we work with clients and apply for a free initial chat. The address again is www.seven-health.com forward slash help. The link's also included in the show notes. Hey everyone, welcome back to Real Health Radio. I'm one of your hosts, Lou Urich, and I'm thrilled to be hosting this podcast for my very first time. I've been a guest on the show twice in episodes 55 and 176, and Chris discussed the exciting changes happening over here at 7 Health in episode 175. One of those exciting changes is me and fellow newbie to the 7 Health team, Amanda Bullitt, who you'll be hearing from in future episodes too. If you've missed a few weeks and want more information on me, Amanda, and all that's new at 7 Health, please go ahead and check out those episodes, then come back and give this one a listen too. Otherwise, stick around and know that I'll become less of a stranger to you very soon. I plan on bringing you new and intriguing episodes once a month. These shows will be similar to what you've come to expect from Real Health Radio and will include interviews with guests on topics like disordered eating, weight stigma, body image, nutrition, health, and culture. I'll also host a solo episode now and then, and you may even hear from some of my past clients. For those of you listeners who've already reached out to me with warm welcomes and kind hellos since hearing the 7 Health News, thank you. I'm truly grateful to be a part of this team, this community, and this podcast, and I'm hopeful that you'll find my presence here beneficial too. This week on the show, I want to talk with you a little bit about self-compassion and its role in healing when it comes to your food and body relationship. I'll also be sharing with you an episode I recorded a few years ago with the pioneer of self-compassion herself, Dr. Kristen Neff. Now, when it comes to eating disorder recovery, ditching diets, practicing intuitive eating, and beginning body image work, getting started can feel like a daunting task. You may ask, is it the eating that I should be focusing on first? And for many, it can feel that way because food is regularly scrutinized and heavily associated with body size and shape when you're dieting. Is it the body image that should take the lead? I mean, maybe if you liked your body more, you'd stop beating yourself up so much about what you fed it or how you moved it. Maybe it's cultural biases and environmental or relational factors that need to be of primary concern. Because how is anyone supposed to heal individually without awareness of what's ailing us collectively? My answer to all of these questions is maybe. There's really no right place to start when it comes to healing and recovery. But I like to begin with you. Because it's pretty difficult to change beliefs and behaviors around food and body if we aren't first working to trust, honor, and understand who we are, what we truly need, what we desire and feel, and how we communicate with ourselves. That's why in my own online course and coaching program, and also my one-to-one work with clients, I often begin by teaching the concept and exploring the benefits of self-compassion work. And that's how I'd like to begin with you today. So what is self-compassion? Maybe I should start by explaining what it's not. Self-compassion is not about self-esteem, feeling better than others, or pursuing perfection. It is about being kind to yourself, no matter what. Self-compassion is about cultivating feelings of security and self-worth in the midst of your successes and your failings. And the more you practice it, the more you'll live it. The oversimplified definition of self-compassion is this. Treat yourself the way you'd treat a friend or a loved one. And for those of you listening, this hopefully hits home. You and I both know you aren't likely to shame and blame a loved one for their perceived failings or speak harshly and unkindly to them when they fall from grace or the illusion of perfection. Nope, you'd probably embrace them, 
provide a safe and loving space for them to feel all of their feelings. You'd encourage them to keep going, to trust the process, to recognize that sometimes shit happens and things go wrong, but it doesn't mean that they're wrong or bad or broken. It just means that they're human, right? Welcome to planet earth. We're all just winging it. Well, that perspective, the one you'd readily share with a friend, turn it towards yourself and that self-compassion. It means treating yourself the way you would someone you love, befriending and supporting you in all of your mess, confusion, and painful humanness. The concept of self-compassion and the compelling research around it was pioneered by Dr. Kristen Neff. You'll be hearing from her in just a minute. But for now, here's how she explains self-compassion in her book, Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself. Having compassion for oneself is really no different than having compassion for others. Think about what the experience of compassion feels like. First, to have compassion for others, you must notice that they're suffering. If you ignore that homeless person on the street, you can't feel compassion for how difficult his or her experience is. Second, compassion involves feeling moved by others' suffering so that your heart responds to their pain. The word compassion literally means to suffer with. When this occurs, you feel warmth, caring, and the desire to help the suffering person in some way. Having compassion also means that you offer understanding and kindness to others when they fail or make mistakes, rather than judging them harshly. Finally, when you feel compassion for another, rather than mere pity, it means that you realize that suffering, failure, and imperfection is a part of the shared human experience. Self-compassion involves acting the same way towards yourself when you're having a difficult time, when you fail or notice something you don't like about yourself. Instead of just ignoring your pain with a stiff upper lip mentality, you stop to tell yourself, this is really difficult right now. And you ask, how can I comfort and care for myself in this moment? Instead of mercilessly judging and criticizing yourself for various inadequacies or shortcomings, self-compassion means you are kind and understanding when confronted with personal failings. After all, whoever said you're supposed to be perfect? To simplify that explanation a bit, here are four steps to practicing self-compassion. One, notice your pain and suffering. Two, extend emotion, sympathy, and a desire to help. Three, offer care and kindness. And four, recognize that it's human to suffer, fail, mess up, lose, and disappoint. And that's okay. These four steps create a perspective shift for those who practice them. It's a shift from the unreachable goal of perfection to the honest and loving acceptance of our fallibility, our mortality, our humanity. And that perspective shift is precisely why self-compassion is a vital part of healing your relationship to food and body. When you're engaged in dieting or restrictive ideas about food and quote, fall off the wagon, what comes next is usually shame, frustration, and self-hate. When you're influenced by cultural beauty ideals or affected by weight stigma and you look at your body in the mirror or try on clothes that don't fit, what typically follows is shame, frustration, and self-hate. When you are, or someone that you love is, steeped in health sensationalism and think that every workout you miss or every processed food you eat will lead to disease or early death, what can also happen is shame, frustration, and self-hate. These responses aren't productive. They treat you as an enemy to be conquered or a problem to be fixed. You become something other than human, like a robot who needs a reboot, or a math equation that must be solved. But you aren't those things. You're a living, breathing, evolving person who will inevitably make mistakes, fail, and disappoint. A person who also has the power to learn, grow, and change according to their lived experience and the increased wisdom that that experience provides. Now, the best way to learn, grow, and change is through self-compassion. Any other approach will leave you feeling badly, and that's no way to live, eat, exercise, or exist. I'm going to share a little example with you now about what self-compassion can actually look like in an experience with food. This example is one that I often share with clients, and it's one that may be quite familiar to you if you've ever dabbled in disordered eating thoughts and behaviors. So imagine with me that you're really craving a grilled cheese, but you think you should eat a salad. And so you do, but of course the salad doesn't satisfy you because hello, you wanted the warm gooey sandwich, not cool, crisp crunchy vegetables. Your dissatisfaction with a salad leads to more cravings and the subconscious sense of being deprived. So you eat a bunch of chips, but you're still not satisfied. So you move on to cookies and then a few spoonfuls of peanut butter and toast and later a slice of cheese, which does not a grilled cheese make. 
And the eating continues, feeling primal and out of control. You've binged. And afterwards, you feel sick, uncomfortably full, gassy, ugh. Now, you could start criticizing yourself for not having more willpower. Side note, willpower actually isn't a thing when it comes to food. Or for not slowing down while eating. You might get mad for munching to the point of sickness, or you might start calling yourself names and despairing about how you'll always be a binger and what that binge eating will inevitably do to your body and what those body changes will inevitably say about you as a person. It's a spiral. If you've been there, you know. But maybe you've made some strides in your healing from disordered eating, and you've learned how a deprived body works, so you already realize that it's actually the restriction and the salad that started this whole thing. It's not you, you're not broken, it's not about willpower, but still you shame yourself for not eating the damn grilled cheese and you beat yourself up for failing at intuitive eating. That's still not self-compassion. Self-compassion looks more like this. Understanding that you're in pain, physically and emotionally, about the binge and extending the soothing thoughts and words your own way. Being kind and compassionate to yourself might mean considering and then putting into practice the care you'd give a loved one who's having side effects from eating beyond physical comfort and feeling distressed about it. Maybe you'd have them lay down or just move slowly. You'd have them rest or drink water or eat stomach soothing foods when they're hungry again. Maybe you'd have them put on loose, comfortable clothes. Whatever caring, feel good responses make sense for that friend. Self-compassion means giving those same things to yourself. You don't have to solve your own problem or make it all go away. Just be there with it. Be there with the after effects of your binge and then take the next right step. Notice the pain, extend the sympathy, and proceed with the thoughts and behaviors that most honor where you are and how you feel currently. In this case, the most honoring thing isn't a grueling workout to punish your body, and it's definitely not making plans to withhold food in the future. But it could be a movie marathon, a bath, a slow walk to get your digestive tract moving, It could mean journaling or speaking to a trusted friend or coach about what started this restriction in the first place and how it led to a binge. Along with taking these steps for yourself, it's important to acknowledge that you're human, that this is life, and you can learn from your experiences without shaming yourself for having them. Of course, this is just one example of how self-compassion is relevant to your food and body relationship, but there are so many more, and they're as unique as you are. Here at 7 Health, we're equipped to teach you and support you in responding to your food, body, and health frustrations with more compassion and less criticism, and in the context of one-to-one relationship, we can get really specific with what that means for you, navigating your particular needs, desires, and experiences with more kindness, acceptance, and peace. So if that's something you're wanting to learn more about or work on together, please don't hesitate to reach out to us or check out our Working Together link in the show notes. And in the meantime, enjoy this interview with Dr. Kristen Neff. Dr. Kristen Neff is currently an associate professor of educational psychology at the University of Texas at Austin. She's a pioneer in the field of self-compassion research, conducting the first empirical studies on self-compassion over a decade ago. In addition to writing numerous academic articles and book chapters on the topic, she's author of the book, Self-Compassion, The Proven Power of Being Kind to Yourself, released by William Morrow, and the six-CD audio set called Self-Compassion Step-by-Step, released by Sounds True. In conjunction with her colleague, Dr. Chris Germer, she's developed an empirically supported eight-week training program called Mindful Self-Compassion and offers workshops on self-compassion worldwide. Dr. Neff is also featured in the best-selling book and award-winning documentary, The Horse Boy, which chronicles her family's journey to Mongolia, where they trekked on horseback to find healing for her autistic son. Hi, Dr. Neff, and welcome to the Untamed Podcast. Hello, nice to be here. I'm so glad to have you here, and I did already introduce you and the work that you're doing in the intro to this episode, but I'd love for you to introduce yourself and let the listeners know a little bit about you and the work that you're doing in the world with self-compassion. Okay, well, so yes, my name is Kristen Neff, and I'm an associate professor at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, My son likes to introduce me to people as the self-compassion lady because um, that's what I do. I I research self-compassion. I was um, the first one to look at it in an academic context, to research it, create a scale to measure it. And I've also developed an intervention program to teach self-compassion. So I'm uh, pretty much a one... uh, (laughs) 
<laughs> one trick pony. I teach and study and work and live self compassion. And I'm so glad you do. I was introduced to your work a few years ago, and it really changed my life. And I know when I reached out to you about being on the show, that's what I shared, as well as now that I have so recognize the power of self-compassion in my own life and with the things that I was going through. It's something that I readily offer. And the book is often something that is required reading for my clients or I'm giving away as gifts. I can't tell you how many times I've given your book away to people because it's so meaningful and so powerful. So I'm, I'm happy that you're a one trick pony on this subject because you're really great at teaching it, speaking about it. I've seen your TED talk and obviously read your book a few times, but I'm curious what got you into this line of study. So was it like one sudden event or a series of, of events that said, yeah, this is what I want to focus on, this thing called self-compassion? Yes, well, I really came at it from a place of personal practice, right? So what had happened, it was my last year of graduate school at UC Berkeley. And um, I guess to put it simply, my life was a mess, right? I had just um, gotten out of a divorce. It was very messy. I was feeling a lot of shame. And then I was just a stressful time in my life because of, you know, trying to finish up my PhD and make a living and all those practical issues. Um, so I thought I would learn how to meditate because I had learned that meditation was good for stress. And really much to my surprise, the woman leading the meditation group, the very first night I went, um, talked a lot about self-compassion, how important it is to include ourselves in the circle of compassion, you know, to be a kind, supportive friend to ourselves. And it was it was one of those light bulb moments for me. You know, I just thought, wow, I never really thought of that before. I could help myself with this stressful time by being a, a kind, supportive friend. And so I started practicing uh, self-compassion in my personal life, and I began reading more about it. Um, my pathway is, you know, primarily through Buddhist meditation, but I don't think it's a particularly Buddhist um, construct, you know, just the idea of, of being good to yourself. And so I started practicing, and it just made a huge difference in my personal life. Um, and then when it came to the fact, well, I did get my PhD and I did get a real job and um, I was conducting research on self-concept development. And I thought, wow, no one's really looked at self-compassion, at least scientifically. And so I thought it was an opportunity for me. So I tried to define what that self-compassion means, created a scale to measure it and started the research ball rolling. And now it's just taken on a life of its own. So it's over 1200 studies now on self-compassion and you know, I've created a training program and other people have created training programs. So it's really, it's really a big movement now in psychology, which is so amazing to see. Yeah. And I think it's taken on a life of its own, obviously, because it matters. It works in terms of, and, and by saying works, right, what does that even really mean? Except for that it's effective in, in helping you move through life in a more peaceful manageable, kind way, for sure. Now, you said that in your process of developing your work on self-compassion, you defined it so that you could study it. How would you define self-compassion for those listeners who might not be, uh, who might not readily know or might not be familiar with the term? Yeah, so, um, well, I knew if I was going to research it, I wanted to come up with a really kind of clear operational definition. So I actually started by thinking, well, what are the elements that need to go into compassion for others? Because, you know, from my point of view, the feeling of compassion for yourself and others is the same. It's just that we much more easily give it to others than we do to ourselves. So I, I realized a few things. First of all, um, in order to have compassion for other people and also ourselves, we need to um, need some mindfulness, right? So mindfulness is basically noticing what's happening as it happens, even if it's unpleasant, instead of immediately trying to push it away or fix it. It means being you know, courageous enough to open to, wow, this is happening right now. And of course, when what's happening is our own pain, the last thing in the world we want to do is open to it. We want to fight it or avoid it. Um, so really the first step of compassion, both for self for self and also others, really. I mean, think about why we don't have compassion for that person who tries to wash our windows for a buck and sometimes we tune them out. It's because we just can't take them in at that moment. You know, it's just too much. So the first step is being willing to open to the fact that suffering is occurring. Um, compassion actually means to suffer with, 
So it's really only relevant in instances of, you know, negative emotional struggle and there's a connected element to it. So, right, so first you have to open to pain and then we need to respond with kindness and warmth, right? You might, you might notice someone was struggling and judge them, you know, bum, get them off the street. But with compassion, same with self-compassion, we respond with kind of kindness, goodwill, the desire to help in some way, to be supportive. Um, and then thirdly, and I didn't realize this had to be there at first when I was thinking about how to define self-compassion, but the question really struck me, well, what's the difference between self-compassion and self-pity, right? Because we don't like self-pity or we don't like to be pitied by others. You know, what's the difference between pity and compassion? Well, with pity, you look down on other people and it's kind of a, a um, an exaggerated sense of, oh, poor you. And with self-pity, it's like, oh, poor me, woe is me, the world's coming to an end. It's a very self-focused, um, kind of melodramatic state of being. And compassion is very different. Compassion just sees things clearly and says, hey, this happens, you know, um, there but for the grace of God go I. It could be me in other circumstances. And part of compassion means seeing the bigger picture. Oh, I see all these causes and conditions had to come into play for this to happen. So it has kind of a wisdom element to it as well. So I argue that self-compassion, in addition to mindfulness and uh, self-kindness, includes a sense of common humanity, recognizing that, you know, pain, difficulty, imp imperfection is really just part of the shared human experience. And if we didn't have that element, it could morph into self-pity, which actually isn't very useful for anyone. <laughs> Yeah. So one of the things you brought up, obviously, as a component of self-compassion is this mindfulness piece. And what does that mean? Because I think people have different terms and it's almost kind of like this. It's, it's a pretty popular term right now, mindfulness, but it can mean something different to a lot of people. So how do you define it? How does it work with self-compassion? Right. So, so mindfulness in general is basically noticing, paying attention to what's happening as it's happening. And it also means um, being aware in a, in a non-judgmental way. So again, instead of trying to run away from something or getting locked in the storyline of what's happening, it's just kind of clear seeing and accepting what's occurring. So mindfulness in the context of self-compassion means you're able to be mindful and aware in a non-judgmental way of actually your own pain, your own suffering. Um, it's funny, I was teaching with Brene Brown and she hates the word mindfulness. It's one of those trigger words for her. And she says, is it okay if we just rename it courageous presence? And I thought, yeah, that's actually a lot better. I like that better. So really there's, it's being present, but when things are difficult, you need some courage to stay open, to stay aware, not to tune out or immediately try to you know, make the situation go away. So um, it's really, you might say, the foundation of self-compassion, because if you aren't willing to be open to the fact that you're really having a hard time right now, you can't respond with kindness, right? If you're just in fix-it problem-solving mode the whole time, or you're blaming other people for all your problems, you can't really give yourself what you need. So mindfulness is, is really the step one, opening to the fact that you're struggling. Yeah, and I find that so important personally because I do practice self-compassion regularly, daily, by the minute, right? <laughs> All the time I try to practice it. I find being present is so important. Present with my feelings and my pain and also with maybe what those inner voices are saying, the inner dialogue that I'm having towards myself or towards my experience. And I recommend that to all of my clients as well. I work with women around body image and disordered eating, and I find it so useful and powerful in that context too. So I like the definition of mindfulness being that courageous presence or the, the willingness to really be there now where the action is, where the pain or the struggle is in order to show compassion to yourself. Yeah, that's right. So so that really is the first step. Um, and then, of course, the next step is, well, when you're aware of the pain and you're in contact with it, how do you react? Um, and that's where the kindness comes in, right? So when you notice that your, your internal voice is criticizing or judging or being cruel or harsh, whatever it is, you actually stop to say, wait a second, I, I, I don't want to talk to myself this way. You know, I, I want to talk to myself like I would treat a friend who was going through what I was going through. So really um, a big part of cultivating self-compassion is cultivating kind of a warm, friendly, supportive attitude 
towards yourself. You know, if you were lucky, maybe you had a parent or grandparent who had this attitude towards you, or maybe you know a teacher when you were growing up. But we know when someone's really unconditionally accepting and loving and really cares about us, wants the best for us, it feels so good. It's so nurturing that we actually can learn to give that to ourselves, which is really one of the key healing factors of self-compassion. Yeah. So you mentioned earlier, and you're talking about it a little bit now, this whole idea of being able to give the kindness and compassion to ourselves that we much more readily give to other people. And you you made mention of like, you know, it's harder for us to treat ourselves that way as opposed to others. Why is that? Why is it harder for us to show that kindness and compassion to self? Yeah, I think there's a couple reasons. Um, one is it's not culturally normative. As a matter of fact, people have all sorts of judgments or fears of self-compassion. It's going to make us lazy. It's going to make us weak. It's selfish. Whereas, you know, most people kind of value the idea of being kind and supportive and caring toward others. So, so part of it is the messages we grow up with. But I actually think it's something that goes a bit deeper. I think there are some physiological reasons why we tend to criticize ourselves and be kind to others. So what we know about self-criticism is basically it's triggered whenever we feel threatened, right? So when, uh, you know, we notice something about ourselves we don't like, maybe we don't like what we see in the mirror or some difficult emotional situation happens, we feel threatened and we go into threat defense mode, fight, flight or freeze. Um, the sympathetic nervous system is called. And this system was uh, evolved to deal with physical threats to our, our well-being. You know, if a lion's chasing you, then your amyg- amygdala gets triggered, you release cortisol and adrenaline, and you get ready for this fight, flight, or freeze response. Um, unfortunately, what happens nowadays is the threats aren't to our physical selves very often. They're much more often to our self-concept. So, for instance, if you look in the mirror and you don't like what you see, you think, oh, there's a problem, there's a danger, I might be rejected. And we go into, again, fight, flight, or freeze mode, and we want to attack the problem to feel safe. Of course, the problem is ourselves, so we end up attacking ourselves. Um, And it's funny, it's not a rational process, but there's a part of us when we harshly criticize ourselves to think maybe, you know, first of all, I'm in control. I know it's right or wrong. Um, maybe I can fix myself so I won't be in danger and I won't be rejected by others. So you might say our, our self-criticism, um, it's kind of a, an honest, innocent reaction. It's a way we try to keep ourselves safe. Um, the only problem is it doesn't keep ourselves safe. It tends to just make things uh, a lot worse for ourselves. But, the, you know, again, the reason we, we more quickly criticize ourselves and our friends is because we don't feel so threatened when our friends fail or make a mistake or maybe they aren't having a, a good hair day, right? Um, it's funny, though, if you notice, we often tend to be a little more critical of the people we're, we're very close to, like maybe our romantic partners. And I suspect part of the reason that is, is because when they do something wrong, so to speak, or they something kind of, you know, there's a problem, we also feel threatened. It's almost like the more threatened we feel when there's something, some mistake or failure in it or inadequacy, the more likely we are to respond with criticism trying to fight the problem, okay? Now, so, so the threat defense system is kind of our most, our oldest and most easily triggered um, way of feeling safe. But we do have another safety system, which is very important. And this is the safety system that self-compassion is rooted in. This is um, the mammalian caregiving system, okay? So what happened when mammals evolved is mammalian young are born very immature. They have a long development period which actually allowed them to uh, successfully adapt to their environment, right? That's why mammals are so successful. But a system needed to evolve that would that would prompt the infant to, feel, to um, stay close to the, the parent so it would be safe, and it would also prompt the parent to try to take care of the infant, right? So we have this uh, attachment system, caregiving bond, uh, which is another way we feel safe. So actually what we're doing um, when we look in the mirror and instead of attacking the problem ourselves to feel safe, we say, hey, I love you anyway. You know, it's okay. I, I accept you unconditionally or, or you say something warm and supportive. That's another way to feel safe um, through this, this, this sense of um, 
of being connected, right? Being connected to ourselves, being connected to others. And in fact, what we know is when you give yourself compassion, you're releasing oxytocin and opiates, those feel-good hormones, right? So in many ways, the, the um, compassion way of feeling safe is more effective because we aren't so freaked out, we aren't so reactive, we have more ability to respond. The only problem is it's not so automatic, right? So we have to use a little effort to respond in this kind way um, than, we, than we do if we, you know, than we do with self-criticism. It's kind of quicker. So it kind of takes a little override to have a self-compassionate response, um, which is why we don't do it quite as often. But it's also a natural response, which is good to know. Yeah, and I found for myself personally that sure those those more primal <laughs> responses come up of like oh my gosh i'm not safe i have to fix this there's a problem but even giving ourselves the compassion to go oh look there it is there's that response that i'm so used to doing that automatic response but now can i feel safe and feel at peace in a different way is like almost giving ourselves the self compassion in in the way that we primally respond to threats and triggers in the first place Yes, no, absolutely. It's, it's, it's quite funny. You don't want to beat yourself up for beating yourself up, right? Yeah. That's, not, that's not the pathway to self-compassion. The way in is by understanding why we beat ourselves up. Oh, I see. I'm just trying to say, stay safe. I don't want to be rejected by others. Okay, I can have compassion for that. And, and what, what happens when we do that actually is we start to um, listen to what the inner critic is trying to tell us. You know, and, and, oh, I see, you're worried that such and such is going to happen. Okay, I hear you. And then once you listen to the inner critic and um, the message it's trying to give you, then usually it calms down and doesn't shout so loudly. And we can more easily tap into these other ways of feeling safe, the compassion system. Yeah. So it's, it's quite interesting, yeah. It is interesting. And that is exactly my experience and, and so much of what you're sharing. And again, because I have borrowed from your work and suggest your work to my clients. So much of what you're sharing is a lot of what we work through. But I'm curious about I'm curious about it because yes, they they can I can teach my clients and of course I'm always practicing this myself to have compassion even when we do go there, even when we do beat ourselves up, even when we are worried about what we look like to others or where our ranking is, where we stand on this hierarchy of value and worth uh, that that culture de has defined for us. But at the end of the day, there is this level of perfection that is marketed to us through media and industries that say, hey, like beauty industry, diet industry. And there's so many things marketed like, oh, yeah, you got to be perfect. You got to be perfect. And we can have all the self-compassion in the world. And yet we'll still probably rub up against the fact of, oh, no, I'm not perfect. There goes that trigger again. Like there goes that response. Yeah, well, that's, that's where common humanity comes in. So really, if you look at what common humanity is, it's the understanding, the deep, you know, in your bones understanding that the human experience is not perfect. The imperfection, whether in terms of, you know, our personal imperfection, mistakes we make, or just the imperfection of life that, you know, you know what happens, stuff happens. This is actually normal and natural, right? So what often happens is, if I were to ask any of your listeners, is there anyone in this entire world who's absolutely perfect? No, of course not. Is there anyone who leads a perfect life? Of course not. So we know this logically. But what happens, and I think you're right, it's reinforced by these media stories we're told, is when we make a mistake or we look in the mirror, we don't like what we see, or we get that call from the doctor, we feel like something has gone wrong. In that moment, it feels as if everyone else in the world is living this perfect life and it's just me who's failed or just me who's not good enough or just me who's struggling in this way. And that sense of that it's just me actually creates a very... Um, powerful feeling of isolation, which is really damaging. And if you really want to cause a human being um, distress, you make, you make them feel isolated from their tribe, right? So what common humanity does and why it's really such a key part of self-compassion is we're always remembering, oh yeah, the human experience means to fail. It means to make mistake. It means being imperfect. It doesn't mean being perfect. And the more, um, the more we're able to remember that and, and make that part of our practice, the less easily we're swayed by these meaty images that, you know, these airbrushed images of how we're supposed to look. So 
that's why I personally really think we need all three components. We need mindfulness, we need the kindness, and we also have to remember what the human experience means. Um, one of my favorite uh, uh, sayings by a meditation teacher is he says, you know, the goal of practice is just to be a compassionate mess. You know, we're going to be a mess no matter what we do, no matter how much we practice, no matter how many meditation retreats we go on or how many therapy sessions we have, we're still going to be a mess because actually the human experience is about being a mess. But are we a compassionate mess? And, you know, when, when I think of that, it's like, oh, I can do that. I can't be perfect. That's not possible. But I can be a compassionate mess. And so that's really I've shifted my goal toward being a compassionate mess. And it's amazing because I can almost always achieve it. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. And I think, too, one of the added components that I often integrate into my work and my own life is this idea of being uh, being critical, a critical consumer of the media and the messages that were being sent all the time and then viewing it through that lens of, of shared humanity of like, OK, this is what they're selling me or this is what they're showing is going on. But I know the truth is that humanity isn't perfect, but it does sometimes take that extra step of going okay, something's not actually quite true here with this representation. Because if we believe the representations are true, then we believe perfection can be achieved. Then we're buying all the things and doing all the striving and and being self-critical because we think we've done something wrong to not have the perfect life or body or diet or whatever it may be. Yeah, and so really a, a big part of the path of self-compassion is um, letting go of the goal of perfection. So and it's not even and it's not even just because you know perfection is unattainable. But you, at some point you start realizing perfection is boring. I mean, if everyone was perfect, if we were all Ken and Barbie dolls, you know, what kind of life would it be? It's it's our it's our foibles and our weaknesses and our edges and all these things that make us all unique and um, you know it's our struggles that make us grow in life. And that is really what being human is about. Is by it's about being imperfect, but in a compassionate way, right? And when you really open your heart to imperfection, and you say to yourself, you know, yeah, you just made a mistake, or you just said something really mean, or you don't look as, as good as I w wish you did, and I love you anyway, that's really where the power is. That's where the freedom is, because then our happiness isn't contingent on perfection, which is, you know, <laughs> a losing wicket, as my British friends would say. <laughs> yes, exactly. I love that. I love that message. And and two, you've been bringing up a little bit, you know, about the fact that life isn't perfect. There's grief. There's trauma. There are these experiences that we have that may not be what we wanted or if we could paint the perfect picture, what it would look like. And yet here we are facing them. But there's also this current of belief in our in our day of, uh, you know, manifestation, law of attraction, answered prayer, let's say, where people still somehow put the onus on them when those things don't work out. Oh, I didn't manifest it hard enough. I didn't pray enough times. Uh, something must be wrong with my law of attraction skills. You know, still they're turning to self and going, I've done it wrong. And so even though there is this grief and trauma, how does one get past that when it comes to self-compassion? Because it almost sounds, it almost seems like, how can you be compassionate with yourself if you, you feel like you have the whole world in control? Yeah, well, part of the wisdom of self-compassion is realizing that you aren't in control. You know, the control is an illusion, right? So the idea, I mean, if in some ways, self-criticism is we, we like we like to be self-critical because we think, well, at least I know what I should have done. And it's like the back of the self-critic is strong and straight and knows what's right and what's wrong. Well, the reality is we don't know what's right or what's wrong. We can't control things. You know, we are just doing the best we can is these compassionate messes from one moment to the next. Control is absolutely impossible. And if you start picking apart why, that's because we aren't these separate, isolated beings. You know, all our lives are so amazingly interconnected that you, there's no way that one node in the spider's web can control every other node, right? It just doesn't work that way. We're part of a larger whole. So really... Um, part of being the, the path of self-compassion is is opening to that, realizing that I don't have control, but actually learning to be okay with it. Um, and more than that, to kind of love yourself and love the world. And, and also there's a certain, I think there's a certain trust that comes that, 
things that are unfolding that are larger than us are, are like bigger than the individual. So, you know, whether or not you think that things always work out for the best, I mean, that, I'm not going to go there, but certainly we can see if, you will, if we look back at our own lives, often um, those experiences that we grew the most from, we wouldn't trade anything for are those that were incredibly painful. You know, the example is, you know, my son's autistic, and I, I talk about him all the time when I talk about self-compassion because it's such a beautiful example of how you think it's the worst thing in the world that was going to happen, right? I mean, who wants a, a diagnosis of autism for their child? But by learning to open to the pain of it and the uncertainty of it and the constant, like, fear and what's going to happen, and, you know, he didn't learn to be toilet train till he was five. <laughs> it was really hard. But because I had my self-compassion practice, I was able over and over again to, first of all, accept my own feelings, my own feelings of grief and disappointment and fear to kind of um, support and be there for myself. And that's what gave me the ability to support and be there for Rowan. Um, and now I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. I mean, not only is he an amazingly cool kid in terms of who he grew, grew up to be, but also just that's really what made me that experience. I wouldn't be nearly as good of a teacher if I hadn't had that experience to draw on and it, it deepened my practice, it helps me, you know, I, I've got all my Rowan stories I tell my students. So, and I think most people, when they look back in their lives, can see that as long as you survived something difficult, it most probably made you stronger. Yes. And I, I'm glad you brought up Rowan. That was one of the things reading your book for the first time years ago really helped me to identify with you because here I was struggling in these other areas of life that I thought were, you know, like the, the main thing. And then I get to the parts in your book where you're talking about Rowan and your experience being a caregiver of a child who had needs. And that's my, I mean, all children have needs, but who had more profound needs and different needs than others. And that's my experience as well. I have a daughter with a very rare chromosomal deletion. And so she has several, several areas where she has developmental de delays or health conditions, epilepsy, things like that as a part of the condition. And I realized without knowing it, the ways in which I had been showing my self-compassion there. And it was actually really useful to, to teach me compassion in other areas of my life to see where I had already been showing up for myself as this, a caregiver of a child who had additional needs, who wasn't going to be parented like by the books, right? And hearing too and reading your experience was so helpful. And I know you talk sometimes about caregivers and self-compassion. I'd love to, for the listeners to hear a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. And actually, that's um, one of my areas of work right now. You know, I've developed a longer eight-week training program in self-compassion, but the local um, Dell Children's Hospital, the pediatric hospital, came to me and said, we, would you teach self-compassion to our healthcare workers? They're all burning out. And, you know, they, they don't have much time and they aren't really interested in meditating. Can you just teach the core practices to help them survive because there's a lot of stress, obviously, in all healthcare, but especially when you're dealing with sick kids. Um, and so, yeah, I'm doing a study now where I've uh, just trained them for four weeks for four 90-minute sessions and, and taught them a lot of the core practices from our self-compassion training program. And, and really what we find, what we're finding, and we haven't gotten our data back yet, but from the preliminary results is that um, what, what happens when you're a caregiver is when you care for someone in distress, like you probably find this with your child too, you're actually feeling their distress literally because the human brain is, is, is wired for empathy. So like, for instance, if you see someone slam their finger in a door, the pain centers of your brain light up, right? So the brain's wired that way. We actually feel what other people are feeling. And of course, if it's someone, um, either we're really close to or someone we're working close to, um, we have what's called emp empathetic distress. So really it's crucial for caregivers to first of all take that very seriously, the fact that I'm feeling pain too, and to give themselves compassion for their own pain um, almost before, I mean, I found with Rowan, I had to do it before I could really focus on him. A, to, to find your seat so you don't get blown over by your own empathetic distress, so you don't get overwhelmed, um, but really so that the compassion can flow easily. If it just flows one direction, if it just goes to the other person and there's none of it that comes back to you, you'll burn out, um, you'll be depleted, and you'll have nothing to give. 
And this is what I think is really cool about self-compassion for caregivers is the people you're caring for also have mirror neurons and they're also picking up on what you're feeling. So if you're feeling stressed and overwhelmed with your daughter, let's say, she's picking up on stress and overwhelm and her mirror neurons are registering stress and overwhelm. But if you're able to be kind of calm and compassionate and warm with yourself, then that's the sig- those are the signals you're also sending to your daughter, the person you're caring for. So what, what I found with Rowan is um, like when I kind of lost it, and let's face it, sometimes I did, he would ramp up, he would get frustrated, his tantrum would increase. And when I gave myself compassion, when I calmed myself down, he would calm down as well. So I really, I, I have a lot of um, excitement about the idea of teaching caregivers, whether it's parents or therapists, or professional caregivers, self-compassion is a way not only to help themselves, but also help their clients. Yeah, I'm excited for this work that you're doing too, because I think so often it, the idea of self, which I don't want to underplay the idea of self-care in the terms that a lot of people, oh, give yourself a break. You need more rest. Maybe you need more nourishment. Maybe you need a massage or uh, do something nice for yourself. And those are all really great things. But I see that thrown, particularly maybe because of the circles I'm in, I see that thrown at parents and special needs parents quite often uh, as like, oh, here, go get a massage. Like, here's this, have a, a self-care day or something. But it goes deeper than that. And that's why I'm excited about your work, because I think self-care is kind of the surface level. Yeah, it's nice. Go ahead, do it by all means. But if we're not doing that deeper work of compassion for how we're really feeling on the inside and what we're really processing through in our everyday lived experience, I think we were missing the mark. Yeah, well, and, and the, the, the major limitation of self-care, I mean, I agree with you, if you can afford it and you have the time, go for it, the more the better. But it all happens off the job. Like, you know, if you're with your daughter and she's having a meltdown, you can't say, whoa, I'm feeling stressed out. I'm going to go get a massage. See you later. You know, you can't say that to a therapist or a nurse, right? So you need something to do in the spot, in the moment when you are with the suffering of the other. Because you remember, that's when your mirror neurons are firing and you're, you're experiencing this empathetic distress. So, like, for instance, we teach a practice in our self-compassion program Um, where you imagine you're breathing in compassion for yourself with every in-breath and you're breathing out for the other. But in for yourself, out for the other. In for yourself, out for the other. And as you breathe in for yourself, what you're also doing is you're kind of validating, oh, this is hard for me too. And it's hard for the other person. And it's hard for me too. You know what I mean? And it's not like you're judging who's suffering more or anything like that. You're just, you're just, you're just including yourself in this idea that I need to give myself compassion as I give the other compassion. And it really helps on the spot in the moment not to be overwhelmed. And, and, then, if you, and then if you can also get a massage, but again, you know, we need something in the moment to help us. And that's where self-compassion is so useful. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because one, it comes down to privilege, right? Do you have the a discretionary income to be able to do a lot of these self-care sort of things? And do you have the time as well? Because like you said, a lot of this is happening on the spot, on the job. It sounds like from our talks, there were some, I know you kind of shared what self-compassion is and the three components, the three main components of it, but it sounded like there was almost this foundation, this prerequisite of one, we have to believe that, that he, the human beings are worthy of compassion and love. And also that we have to understand that we can't control the world and we can't control all the events of our life. Like this sort of sound like this underlying foundation to self-compassion. Yeah. So, so, right. So people who really believe they aren't worthy of compassion, it's a really hard block to get around because you, you can't make a logical argument to you know, convince someone why they're worthy of compassion. It, it kind of, I think what happens is eventually, because all those beliefs that somehow I'm not worthy or, you know, I want to control, they all stem from fear, really. That's where they come from. And often the beliefs that we aren't worthy stems from our early childhood and we are given that message and it was just safer to believe them than to question them, right? So when we're in a state of fear and we want to control and we think, you know, if I hate myself, well, then it's the devil I know. Um, there's, again, there's, there's a way in which that helps us feel safe, but it's just not, it, it's not very productive and it ends up causing, causing a lot of harm. 
So it's almost as if people need to um, give it a try, give self-compassion a try. You know, well, what happens if I try to be friendly and supportive as opposed to cutting myself down? You know, is it going to make me lose control? Am I going to be less motivated? Is my world going to fall apart? Will something her- terrible happen? And and people quite generally fine no it's quite the opposite it helps them be more motivated it helps them make better decisions um you know it helps them show up for others more in the world but it, at a certain level i think it just has to be um experienced you know it's i think you're right in that it's kind of part of a larger um in a, in a weird way self-compassion is an experience it's not really an idea and so that experience of connectedness, that experience of love, that experience of safety is what we, we need in order to really start making the shift at a deeper level. So that's why therapists are so good, especially for people with trauma histories. There's actually, I should probably mention this since you do, you may have some people listening to your show who do have a trauma history. And it's not just people with a trauma history. I mean, trauma is just being a woman in our society, really. That there's a phenomena that happens with self-compassion that we like to call backdraft. So backdraft um, is a firefighting term, and it refers to what happens when you know fire crew gets to a house and it's on fire. They don't just fling open the doors of the house because if they do that, the air rushes in and the flames rush out. Instead, what they do is they go around the ho- house and poke little holes in it to kind of let you know let the air in, um, let things uh, reach a state of equal- equilibrium more slowly, so you don't get that big explosion. Well, actually, sometimes with self-compassion practice, we can have backdraft as well. It's like we close the doors of our heart our entire life to protect ourselves. And we start opening the doors of our heart and the love rushes in and the old pain rushes out. And and sometimes it can feel kind of explosive. It can feel experiences, anger or fear. There's a lot of different ways it manifests. So what people need to know is, first of all, um, this is a good sign, not a bad sign. (laughs) People often think when they get backdraft, oh, I'm doing this practice wrong or it's another thing I can't do. It's actually, it means you're doing it right. It means the old pain is starting to come out. This isn't new pain. This pain isn't caused by the compassion. This is just old pain that you've given space for it to come out, okay? And and basically, you can't heal what you can't feel. So it's, it's a good sign that this pain is coming out. But what it means is we need to be compassionate in how we approach self-compassion. We need to, like, poke little holes in ourselves as opposed to flinging open the doors of our heart, which means we need to go at a pace that feels right. If you have a trauma history, then you give you give yourself compassion and you feel really frightened. Well, maybe just, you know, do it quickly and then give yourself some space or spend more time taking a walk or breathing. And In other words, don't overwhelm yourself with compassion. Allow yourself to go slowly. You know, we have a saying, walk slowly, go farther. Right. So be compassionate in the way you approach self-compassion. But um, don't be at all surprised if you you try to be kind to yourself and, and what uh, arises is the opposite. It's kind of part of the healing process. I'm so glad you brought that up. It was on my list of things to ask you to talk about because that is one of the difficult things, one of the humps to you need to get over when it comes to beginning to practice self-compassion. Are there any others that you find that your students or people that you that have gone through your program or read your book get stuck on? Like, is there is there something they've just got to get over before they can really dive into the self-compassion work? Yeah. So, I mean, so, so backdraft is a huge one. Um, but really we have, there's, there's usually every time I talk to any crowd or talk to anyone, really, there's usually about five main blocks to self-compassion that come up. These are really fears of self-compassion. Um, one is that it's weak. People think that that harsh inner critic, you know, keeps them strong and that if they're kind to themselves, they'll be weak and vulnerable. And who wants to be weak and vulnerable, right? So, um, you know, people need to understand, luckily now we've got so much research that supports all of these things. You know, you, if you don't believe me, you can go look at the research on my website. But um, self-compassion doesn't make you weaker. It makes you stronger. In fact, we're finding out that it's one of the strongest sources of coping and resilience we have, right? Just for, for example, we did a study looking at vets coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan. And a lot of vets suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome from the combat they saw. 
And we found that that self-compassion levels was more predictive of whether or not they developed PTSD one year later than the level of combat exposure, right? So again, it's like, are you being an inner enemy or an inner ally? Well, if you're an inner ally, obviously you're going to be stronger than if you're an inner enemy, you're going to weaken yourself. But people are confused about that and they're actually afraid of this weakness. So they got to kind of, and again, in some ways, the only way you really believe it is by trying it out. You know, just try being a supportive inner ally and see if that helps you or hurt you. And most people see that it helps them. Um, things like they're afraid it's going to take away their edge, right? It's going to undermine their motivation. You know, all the research shows it's exactly the opposite. What happens if we're a habitual self-critic is we become afraid of failure. We give up because it's too painful to try. You know, we don't want to disappoint ourselves and others. Self-compassion gives you the sense of safety needed to take risks, to risk failure. And then if you do fail, to pick yourself up and try again. So it's linked to more motivation. Um, this, people have a lot of fears of self-compassion. They're afraid it's going to make them self-indulgent, right? They're just going to give them a skip work and eat ice cream all day, right? When, again, the research shows it leads to people taking better care of themselves because they care. Um, so there's, there's a whole host of misgivings people have about self-compassion. And I have to say our culture, you know, our, you do not, you are not raised in this culture thinking self-compassion is a great thing. We're deeply suspicious of it. So those are blocks that have to be gotten through. And, and I think really the research does help because people, you know, they put some faith in research and it helps with the credibility of it. But at the end of the day, you got to try it out for yourself and see how does this work for me? And now some people are finally willing to say, okay, this works. I'll give it a try. It's worth the effort. <laughs> right. Absolutely. I mean, for the most part, people aren't discovering self-compassion or turning to it or even curious about it unless what they're doing currently isn't working in their life. So at that point, you might as well just give it a try. And I, I often share this with my clients is like, let's just experiment with it. Like, just be an observer, be a scientist yourself, an anthropologist, you're studying you and give it a try and see what happens. Take notes, observe and yeah, just really inspect it for yourself. But the only way is through that experience. Yeah, I think that's, that's right. Yeah, yeah. But but the science does help. I'm so glad there's so much research out there because um, otherwise people wouldn't be taking it nearly so seriously. So, But science isn't enough, as we know. Right. <laughs> science on global warming isn't enough so far, is it? Oh, so gosh, no. So I we're, we're talking about science right now, and I'm a total science geek. I am not a scientist, but I love all things science and physiology. So I would love to hear from you. What are the biological responses to self-compassion in our body? What happens in our body when we're self-compassionate? Right. So, um, you know, I would say the research here is more in its infancy. We do have some research, not as much as we do in terms of like well-being, depression, anxiety, et cetera. But basically it comes back to um, how we how we respond in terms of um, sympathetic versus parasympathetic reactions. Right. So, we you know, sympathetic response is, you know, we get anxiety, we get triggered, fight or flight. Um, parasympathetic is like increased heart rate variability, more flexible responding, um, you know, releasing oxytocin, opiates, etc. So what self-compassion does is it directly decreases the stress response, the sympathetic response, the fight or flight response. So for instance, we know it reduces cortisol, salivary cortisol, or it reduces um, activity in the amygdala, and it increases things like heart rate variability. So that's probably maybe in the moment the biggest thing it gives you is the ability to feel calm and safe by activating your parasympathetic nervous system. Um, with the, there's a couple other research studies out there. Um, so one study, now this is just one study, so don't make too much of it, but found that especially the, the common humanity component of self-compassion that's measured on my scale actually was increased to um, lengthen telomeres. Right. And so we, we know increasingly that telomeres, which are the end caps of the genes and predict um, longevity, that they're, they're actually um, really impacted by your state of mind. So when you're in a constant state of threat and it's so terrible and I'm so terrible, that actually does things like shrinks our tel telomeres and reduces our lifespan. So there's some hint that maybe self-compassion um, versus that process. Um, and another study, actually, it's a cool study. Um, 
Someone taught our mindful self-compassion program to a group of people with diabetes. And not only did it help them cope with their diabetes psychologically, it actually stabilized their glucose levels, right? So we know that when you are in the state of, um, you know, another term I use for the three components of self-compassion, which is more evocative, um, is loving, connected presence. Mm -hmm. Loving is the kindness, connected, common humanity, presence is mindfulness. So if you think about it, the more you are in a state of loving, connected presence mentally, that kind of translates to your whole body. You feel calmer, you feel safer, things work better. Um, and it, um, there's also a little bit of um, evidence that it enhances immune function, right? And again, it's all in its infancy, but it, it's totally consistent with what we know about mindfulness practice and also um, what happens with compassion for others. So it's, it's very good for you physiologically as well as mentally. And of course, the two are so intertwined. It's all so interesting to me, especially the part you brought up about uh, the new recent study with diabetes patients, because I think so often there, the sympathetic nervous system is triggered by things like diet culture and the like the fear and the stress of the medical condition and what you're eating or not, or what your body size is or not, that sometimes can be, uh, I will say, correlated, not necessarily the causative connection, but the correlation to uh, diabetes. And so those things are stressing you out. And you shared already what some of the stuff that happens, the fight flight response that happens with the sympathetic nervous system. But if we can trigger instead parasympathetic nervous system and bring more peace to those aspects of our body and those internal functions physiologically, it makes perfect sense to me that it would actually positively affect their health. That's right. And so actually, because of this link between the, the mental and the physiological, one of the main uh, ways we teach people to help evoke a state of loving, connected presence or self-compassion is by um, physical touch. You know, and it feels really weird at first. It, it really does. We teach people to put your hands on your heart or hold your own hand or, or cup your cheeks like you might hold the face of a small child. Because what we know about the body is that the body doesn't really distinguish whether it's you touching yourself or someone else touching you. The body is programmed through evolution to respond to warmth, um, gentle touch, and kind of soft vocal sounds, soothing vocal sounds with the, with the parasympathetic response. It feels safe, it feels cared for. Just think of like a, a mommy cat with their little kittens all snuggled up and purring, you know. This is what we're programmed for as mammals. So sometimes you, your head can't go into the direction of self-compassion because it's too full of the story of how awful you are, how awful the situation is. So just putting your hands on your heart or, or your stomach can really help, again, help you feel cared for and, and calm down. So, you know, we say, yeah, it feels funny at first. It does but it works. <laughs> so give it a try. <laughs> well, no, or if you have a partner, see, my husband can attest to the fact that after I read your book and started practicing self-compassion and was like, this actually is life-changing, I would literally like find myself in a state of frenzy or self-criticism and just walk up to him and be like, okay, need a hug. Like, this is totally selfish. I'm not hugging you right now. I need you to hug me. I want to feel, not that we can't do that for ourselves also, but if you have a partner who's willing to give you a hug, <laughs> It's nicer. But yeah, what's amazing is you aren't totally dependent on someone to be there. Exactly. Self-touch is, is pretty powerful. And also self-talk, right? So there's research coming out now that if, if you talk to yourself in the third person, like call yourself by your first name, or I like to use terms of endearment with myself. I feel comfortable with that. But that actually, um, it has a really big effect on the brain because the brain registers it it kind of goes into social connection mode, even though you're, it's you talking to yourself. So things like just talking to yourself in a friendly, supportive way and saying, you know, hey, buddy, I'm here for you. Things like that. Again, they, they feel funny at first. You got to get used to it, but they're actually surprisingly effective. You know, and that's why I like to, I like to sometimes say self-compassion isn't rocket science. It's not like you, you know, have to learn this incredibly complicated skill because most of us, have a lot of experience in how to be a good friend. You know, one of the primary tasks of growing up is learning how to be a friend, how to be there for someone, how to co console someone when they're upset, what tone of voice to use, what to say, right? People are different, but most people have a pretty good grasp on what that feels like to be a good supportive friend to someone else. So all you have to do with self-compassion 
it's, it's actually give yourself permission to do it with yourself. And then, and then all the tools are already in place. So it, it's, very, it's a very learnable skill, which is what's so encouraging about it. I know we're running towards our time limit here for our interview today. So before we go, I know that besides your research, besides your teaching and writing the book that you wrote, you also do have interventions for people who want to learn how to be more compassionate towards themselves. And I'd love for you to share with the listeners where they can get their hands on these courses if they would like to participate. Yeah, well, probably the easiest way to do it is just to go to my website, selfcompassion.org. Google self-compassion and you'll find me. Um, and so uh, we have, first of all, we have a training program. You might have a local teacher in your area who teaches the Mindful Self-Compassion course. But I'm also coming out with an online course um, with Chris Germer, who developed the program with me, um, with Sounds True in October, an eight-session course that came out really, really good, if I say so myself. <laughs> so that will also be available. So if you just go to my website, selfcompassion.org, you'll find all the links you need to, to do more. You'll also find free guided meditations and practices. I've, I've tried to make it a really good resource for people to get started on the path. So Awesome. Great. So Dr. Neff, I'm so grateful that you were here today and willing to speak with us about self-compassion. And I'm very appreciative of the work that you're doing in the world. Oh, thank you so much. That's sweet. It was my pleasure. So that's it for this week's show. As I mentioned at the top, Seven Health is again taking on new clients. If you're interested in working together or finding out more, head over to www.seven-health.com forward slash help.